Morning, ladies and gentlemen. This case is about the cold blooded execution of two people. The evidence that you'll hear, the undisputed evidence, is that Elizabeth Broderick, the defendant, shot and killed two people as they lay helpless in their sleep. And she did it because she hated them. This is a murder case. There will be no question that Elizabeth Broderick, with her own hands, wiped out the lives of two people. Two people who, just like every one of us in this room, have a right to live. But she decided, Elizabeth Broderick decided, that she had the right to take those lives away. Ladies and gentlemen, she didn't. Nobody does. And that's why we're here. Even though it might be argued to you otherwise, because it sometimes is by some defendants who think that they're somehow special, and therefore they're somehow above the law. This case really isn't any different than any other murder case, which are all tragic. The evidence that you'll hear is going to involve human beings. Murder is a human crime. Human beings who are the victims, people who had good qualities and bad qualities, who were loved and admired by some, perhaps disliked by others. They're just people, always. And a human being who is the defendant, who may also have good qualities and bad qualities, but who, in this case, consistently chose to solve her problems in a way that is unacceptable in our society, a society that has rules and laws that are supposed to apply to everyone. Elizabeth Broderick doesn't think they should apply to her. But if they don't, then they're not worth having. There are two victims in this case. <laughs> Both of them were certainly not unknown to the defendant. One of them was her ex-husband, a man named Daniel Broderick. He was 44 years old. The defendant and Dan Broderick had been separated and divorced for almost five years. Their marriage had been long over. Dan Broderick had wanted very much for a very long time to simply be allowed to go on with his life, to be happy. But that was exactly what Elizabeth Broderick was determined to not let happen. The other person that she killed was a young woman named Linda Colcana Broderick. He was 28 years old. She and Dan Broderick had been married just about six months on this happened. During that time, despite the things that the defendant was doing, they were probably happier than they had ever been. They were looking forward to starting a family, they were actively trying. Linda had her whole life ahead of her, but she wasn't allowed to live it. Because on the morning of November the 5th, 1989, Elizabeth Broderick snuck into Dan and Linda Broderick's home in the early morning hours. And while they lay there in their bed, completely helpless, completely defenseless, she pointed a 38 caliber gun at their bodies and just plain executed them. What had moments earlier been a warm and peaceful Sunday morning for two living, breathing human beings exploded into violence at the hands of a Muslim. Elizabeth Broderick was the immediate suspect in these murders. And they were discovered a couple hours later. Everyone who knew Dan and Linda, when they heard the tragic news that day, they knew that Elizabeth Broderick had done it because her hate and her mindset of revenge was something that everyone who knew her, even as an acquaintance, was very well aware of. She'd been threatening to kill them for years. Only a few weeks before the murders, as a matter of fact, she had a conversation with a woman named Linda David, who was a housekeeper at the Empire's. And in that conversation, she told Miss David that she knew that Dan and Linda just wanted to be left alone, but that that wasn't going to happen. She'd been harassing them for years, and she was going to continue to do whatever she could to make their lives miserable. She said specifically about Dan, I'm either going to make his life a living hell or I'm gonna murder. It was only about two weeks after that conversation 
when the opportunity presented itself. And she did just exactly what she said she was going to do. She went over there and murdered him. I want to tell you first about what exactly what Elizabeth Broderick did that morning. Because this case isn't just about murder. It's about what the law defines as premeditated murder. A premeditated murder doesn't require weeks and weeks of intricate planning. It requires only that a deliberate, considered decision to kill be made before the actual killing. And so the facts and circumstances surrounding just exactly how she killed these two people are obviously the things that you're going to want to focus your attention on in this trial. You will see from the evidence that what happened on that morning was not a situation that was suddenly thrust upon Elizabeth Broderick. She wasn't, for example, confronted or physically threatened in any way by either Dan or Linda Broderick. That morning, or the day before, or the week before, or the month before, or the year before. In fact, they were very afraid of her, truly afraid of what she was capable of doing. And for quite some time, they had done everything they could to avoid her. The evidence will show that what happened on that morning was without question something that Elizabeth Broderick specifically sought out. She went to where they were, knowing where they'd be, knowing exactly how vulnerable they'd be, and taking with her an object that's not only designed to kill, but that was loaded and ready to kill. Elizabeth Broderick lived in La Jolla at the time that this occurred. Dan and Linda lived in an area in Hillcrest, which is called Marston Hills. It's close to Balboa Park. It's about a 10, 15 minute drive away. She'd gotten up very early that morning while everyone else in the house was still asleep. Her two sons, Danny and Rhett, who were 10 and 13 years old at the time, were staying with her that weekend. And her boyfriend, a man named Brad Wright, had also spent the night there. She left them all sleeping soundly, her two sons not knowing that they would never see their father again. And she chose to leave her safe and comfortable home and to get into her car and to drive across town to Dan and Linda's house. She took with her two things, two critical things. One was the gun. It's a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson five-shot revolver, her gun. The other was a set of keys with a very identifiable key on it that she knew would get her into Dan and Linda's house. The gun she had loaded up with hollow point bullets, which are bullets specifically designed to do the maximum amount of damage possible when shot into someone. They're designed to kill. The keys were her keys. They belonged to her daughter, Kim. And they had mysteriously disappeared from Kim's possession <laughs> earlier when she'd been with her mother. Kim didn't know where they were. Elizabeth Broderick had kept them because she knew there was going to come a time when she had the opportunity to use them. When the defendant got to Dan and Linda Broderick's house that morning, it was still very early. It was about 5.30 in the morning. It was a Sunday morning. It was quiet. It was peaceful. And the entire city was basically sound asleep. And at that point, when she parked her car in front of the house, she obviously had the opportunity to think about what she was doing. This was not an immediate, rash, impulsive act. She had that opportunity on the entire drive over this. There were no distractions. There was no one forcing her to do anything. She chose to go forward. She was determined to do it. And she made deliberate choices every step of the way. She chose to take the gun out of her purse so that she'd have it right there in her hand, ready to use. She chose to take the keys out of the car. She chose to get out of the car. And she chose to go up to their house. She knew that Dan and Linda would be home alone that morning. 
Dan and Elizabeth Broderick had had four children together. Their two daughters, Kim and Lee, didn't live at home anymore. They were grown. And as I mentioned, their two sons, Danny and Red, she left back at her house in La Jolla. So she knew they'd be there alone. She also knew her way around their house. She had never lived there. It had never been her home. But over the years, she had gone into that house when she knew she had no right to be there. She'd go through their rooms. She'd go through their things. She'd move things, she'd take photographs, she'd take things, little things, all in violation of restraining orders. But that never mattered. Those were just another set of rules that she didn't think should apply to her. So she knew the layout well. And I want to show you the layout as well. This is a videotape that was taken of Dan and Linda's home by an investigator a couple of weeks uh, after the murders. So the scene has essentially been cleaned up. And it was taken during the daylight so that you could, you could see. As you can see, this is their home. It's set back some distance from the street, not a real far distance. She had parked out in the street and approached the house. She didn't go in the front door, even though it's the most logical door to go into because it's at the front of the house. And even though this key worked to the front door, but there was a reason for that. And you'll see as we get inside the house that the master bedroom, Dan and Linda Broderick's bedroom, was at the top of the stairs, and the stairs are right inside the front door. And so if she got in that front door, there was a possibility that they might have heard her. So she chose to go around the house and go in the back door so that she couldn't be heard. This is the back door that she went into the house. You can see that it was a two storage house. Right off the back door is the kitchen. She went through the kitchen. to a hallway. You can see this is the front door and the stairs right as you enter the front door. You can see the door to their bedroom right off the top of the stairs. Again, she didn't go in that door at the top of the stairs, even though she could have. Nothing was preventing her from doing that. And it's obviously the most logical door to get Your Honor, may we approach? What's not this, sir? 
Don't be argumentative. Go from state to right. As you can see from their position on the beds, if they had been awake, they might have been able to see them, might have been able to do something to protect themselves. And so she didn't go in this door. All right, I'm going to object again. We have rulings as to this. Staying in the district. She came in the back door in this well, so not the library. Go ahead. She went down this hallway. into a little TV room, which is behind the bedroom. Your Honor, the purpose of it was to show the layout of the house. I object. You can just, you just drive the path. That's, that's permissible. Go ahead. And this is the back or the second door to the bedroom, which is the door that she came in. She had the cover of the lamp here. She was coming in a dark corner. The windows were on the other side of the room. Right. She was coming in from Sustain, don't, don't argue what your interpretation of the room is, Ms. Wells, just show them the layout of the room and the path the defendant took in going up there. Dan and Linda were in bed, sound asleep. It was 5.30 on a Sunday morning. They'd been out the night before with friends having dinner. Elizabeth Frederick stood right next to the bed, literally almost right on top of them. And without hesitation, and those are her words, after she entered the bedroom, without hesitation, she opened fire and gunned them down. She pointed the gun at them and she pulled the trigger five times. And this is not an automatic. This is a revolver. You have to pull the trigger each time in order to shoot this gun. And you will see that it's not a particularly easy trigger to pull. And you'll also see that every one of her shots was aimed to kill. This is a scale diagram of the bedroom. Two different pictures of the same bedroom. When the defendant entered the bedroom, she stood right about here. Linda was basically lying flat on her back in the bed. The first shot at her went right into her chest, right above her heart, right exactly where you'd shoot someone if you were intending to kill them. That shot went completely through her body and into the bed underneath her. That shot in itself would have killed her. It was fatal. She shot Dan, who was most probably lying on his side with his back to her because she shot him right in the middle of the bed. And he either tried to frantically dive away as she was shooting at him, or he simply fell off the bed in response to being shot. A second shot at him missed and went right into the wall beyond him. Linda had also reacted to being shot by trying to roll away or get away from the defendant. But the defendant shot at her two more times. One shot just barely missed her head, went into the nightstand right next to the bed. The other shot was right on target right in the middle of the back of her head. That shot exploded through her brain and killed her instantly. They both were shot in the back as they were trying to get away. She had to aim at Linda. She had to change her aim to get Dan. She had to change her aim again to get Linda again. The bullet that hit Dan, who was now lying on its on the floor, had pierced through his lung, but he didn't die instantly. As he lay there on the floor, wounded, he tried to reach for the phone that was on the nightstand next to the bed, presumably to call for help. 
Elizabeth Broderick was now out of bullets with a five shot gun. She had shot all five of them, two at Dan and three at Linda. But Dan was still alive and reaching for the phone. It's at this point that the evidence will show how clearly the defendant's intent was to kill these two people. Because when she saw that Dan was still alive, she didn't pick up the phone herself and call 911 and say, oh my God, I just shot two people, come quick, what have I done? She didn't just panic and run out of the house. What she did was to walk all the way around the bed over to where Dan was lying, to where, as she later told someone, she could hear him gurgling in his own blood. And what she did was she picked up the phone and ripped it out of the wall, literally tearing the cord in half. And she did it in her own words so he couldn't save himself. <laughs> there would be no chance to call for help. She then walked out of the room, dumping the broken phone at the top of the stairs. And when she left, this is a photograph of the scene. Linda lay dead in a pool of blood. Dan Broderick was left to essentially suffocate in his own blood, die anywhere from a couple of minutes to as much as a half hour later. The shot that he took actually was very similar to the shot that President Reagan took through his lung. But President Reagan was rushed to the hospital and he survived and didn't have that opportunity. Not once in the minutes to hours after Elizabeth Broderick left them there while she was busily calling people to tell them what she had done, not once did she express any remorse for what she'd done or did she make any effort to get them help? She went over there wanting them dead and she made sure that they died. Well, what was the motive for these killings? People don't just kill other people out of the blue. There's always a reason in any murder, which is distinguishable from an excuse. We always hear in the movies that murders involve motive and opportunity. Obviously, she had the opportunity. She can't and won't deny that she killed Dan and Linda Broderick. She told too many people that morning that she did it. She called one friend and said, I shot Dan. I finally did it. But she can't deny that. Did she have a motive? Absolutely. And it's probably the oldest and most common motive there is. I said it at the very beginning, hate pure, unadulterated, intense, obsessive, jealous hate. Counsel himself, I think, was the one who brought up the phrase about a woman scorned. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I think perhaps the phrase might more appropriately be hell hath no fury like a person scorned, because being scorned or being romantically rejected is pretty common to both sexes. And being hurt, and being angry, and even some sort of revenge over it is universal. Most people put the hurt and anger behind and move on with their lives. Elizabeth Broderick chose not to. And you will see that it was a choice that she made to keep that hate alive. With her, that hate became her life. And she's still filled with it. I do want to describe for you at least some of the background that led to these events because you can see the building fury on her part. And not just the fury at having been rejected, but the fury at never being able to effectively get even for it. That's what kept it going. What I think you will see from the evidence is that there is a lot more to the background of what happened here than Elizabeth Broderick ever wanted people to know. She wanted, and wants very badly, to be viewed entirely as the victim in this scenario. And she went about in very subtle ways, setting up situations to continue to make it look that way. There is a lot more to this woman than meets the eye.
there are certainly a lot of things that aren't disputed that you're going to hear. Dan and Elizabeth Broderick had been married, obviously, and unfortunately, like over 50% of the marriages in this state, their marriage ended in divorce, which is not a happy circumstance for anyone. They had had four children together, four neat kids. By the time they had separated, which was in 1985, Dan Broderick had become a fairly well-known attorney here in San Diego. And he was somewhat unique because he had not only a legal degree, but a medical degree as well. He was very bright. Uh, he worked extremely hard and always had. And he was known in the legal community for being entirely ethical. In fact, almost without exception, when people described Dan Broderick, whether they worked with him or for him or against him, the two things that came to mind was one, how hard he always worked, and two, his integrity. He loved the law. And those things combined to make him a, a very well-respected and financially successful attorney. He was, for example, in 1986, voted to be the president of the San Diego Bar Association, the local association of attorneys. And he was very involved in teaching new young attorneys about the practice of law. He was involved in teaching doctors about how to avoid malpractice. Their separation occurred in 1985. And at that point, it was Dan Rudder who made the decision to leave the marriage. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more about why that happened in a minute. One thing you will see from the evidence is that from that point, Elizabeth Broderick was bitter in a major, major way. And what had once been and described by her as an ideal marriage suddenly became something very different. From the time of their separation, she essentially went on a campaign to do everything she could to hurt Dan Broderick. One of the ways to hurt him was to try and destroy his reputation, which she knew was important to him. This was not a divorce that he was going to be allowed to have in private. She wanted everyone to hear, and even people who didn't particularly want to hear, all the details, all the details that she wanted to share. She actually developed quite a reputation around town for telling her story, sometimes almost verbatim to friends, to Dan's colleagues, to her children's teachers, to neighbors, to newspaper reporters. She told her daughter that she was going to ruin him. A lot of her friends who, right after the separation, tried to offer all sorts of support and, and help and suggestions for moving on with her life Lots of marriages break up. A lot of her friends' marriages had broken up. Even they were ultimately driven away by her steadfast refusal to let go and by her need for vengeance. She was described as being out for blood, and that made people feel uncomfortable. And that started at the very beginning, and it never ended. Her story that she told most people about why the marriage broke up, one that she told over and over, was basically of a woman who had given up a wealthy, pampered life to marry this struggling, unsophisticated, even unattractive, according to her, young man, whom she then basically molded. She claimed that she put him through his schooling, that she taught him his social graces, that she financially struggled with him, and then finally, just when he became the success that she had made him, he up and left her for another woman in the cocaine. Basically, as she described it, he turned 40 and she became the victim of his midlife crisis. That's a story that, at face value, people are generally inclined to accept because even if it were entirely true, it's not particularly uncommon. But the evidence will show that there is a lot more to it than that in this case. There is a real definite amount of distortion and exaggeration in Elizabeth Broderick's accounts of things. 
that even her children who lived through this recognized about the little things and about the big things. Little things like that Dan, who was unquestionably talented in his own right, was already in his third year of medical school when they married. All of his medical school education was paid for by his parents, not by Elizabeth Trotter. When he decided to go on to law school, he didn't feel that he should take any more money from his parents. He was the oldest of nine kids. He had a lot of other kids to put through school. And so he worked part-time, went to school full-time, and he paid for his law school education entirely by loans that he then paid back with the money that he made as an attorney, a fairly common way of doing it. If Dan and Elizabeth Broderick struggled financially when they were very first married, uh, and they did, they both worked hard, not unlike most young married couples, it wasn't too many years before they were both reaping the benefits of his ultimate success. They moved to San Diego in 1973 when he finished law school. <clears throat> and he was immediately hired by the most prestigious and highest paying law firm in San Diego, right out of the chute. They couldn't have done any better. And Dan Broderick immediately impressed people. By 1979, years before they separated, several years, he'd gone into practice on his own, and they were doing very well, for him, at least from most people's standards. They had moved to La Jolla, one of the nicest places in San Diego to live. Their children were all in the, the finest private schools. Uh, over the next few years, they were able to take trips to Europe and Cancun and the Bahamas. They took ski vacations every year. Elizabeth Broderick had, in her own words, a closet full of $2,000 dresses. At one ball, she wore a $10,000 designer dress. Dan Broderick wore a top hat and a cape. They were a very striking couple to look at. People noticed them. From the outside, it appeared as though they had it all. But unfortunately, as is sometimes the case, all of these things do not necessarily make for a happy marriage. Although Elizabeth Broderick has told many people that they were both so happy during these years and that the only problem was Dan and his midlife crisis, that just wasn't true. Because in other contexts, she has admitted that they had significant problems in their marriage from the very beginning. Uh, she's admitted that they not only talked about divorce, but that she had threatened divorce, she had demanded divorce herself from the very early years of their marriage. Her daughter can remember from the time she was very little, her mother saying to her, your dad and I are going to get a divorce. Who are you going to live with? Elizabeth Broderick has in fact said, and this may be a real underlying factor, that she was never in love with Dan Broderick. When she met him, he was a nerd. But she married him because she knew he was going to be a success. He was going to be a moneymaker, a money-making machine. And marrying him was a great investment. It fit perfectly into the image that she wanted for her life. The successful husband, the beautiful home, the picture-perfect children, the status of a wealthy social worker. This case is not about why the Broderick marriage was trouble, or why it broke up, or who is at fault. Fault is a real tenuous concept when you're talking about a relationship between two people, especially when one of those two isn't here to tell you his side, or what he was going through or what he was feeling or how hard he tried. The fact is that the Broderick marriage had always been trouble. And Elizabeth Broderick was never someone who was hesitant at expressing her displeasure over things. She has and always has had a very strong, very strong personality. And to someone on the receiving end of that displeasure, life probably wasn't so great. If she was angry at Dan, for example, for having drinks with his friends after work instead of coming immediately home, which was apparently a long-standing bone of contention, she would lock him out of the house. 
uh, not just by locking the door, but by wedging his favorite ski in the door, for example, so that when he opened the door, he would break it. If she was angry at Dan for taking the kids out for pizza and staying out too late on a school night, her response was to throw a stereo at him when he opened the front door. At the dinner table, if she got angry, she was known to pick up ketchup bottles and throw them across the room. Sometimes she would intentionally break things that were important to him, like a favorite picture. Her daughter had seen her dig her fingernails into his arms, scratch him, yell at him, throw hair jar, uh, jars of hair gel at him. Even outside the home, one of the most consistent descriptions from people who knew them during these years was how noticeably critical Elizabeth Broderick always was of Dan in front of other people, always criticizing his looks, his clothes, his decisions, not major things, just chipping away, making other people feel uncomfortable. She's described by one friend as being a great put-down artist. And these observations of people, many people, were occurring long before, years before, a young woman named Linda Polkana ever came into the picture. In fact, uh, they were noticeable to people even before their youngest son, Rhett, was born in 1979. Linda Colquina moved to San Diego in 1983. She had worked uh, for several years in Atlanta as a paralegal for another attorney. She'd been a flight attendant for Delta Airlines before that. When she decided to move to San Diego, the attorney that she worked for, who bought the world of her in her ability, recommended several attorneys here in San Diego to look up for a job. And one of them was Dan Brunner, who at the time was expanding and needed some help. Dan hired her in September of 1983 as a paralegal office manager. She was 22 years old. She too was very bright. She was full of life and fun and uncritical. And it's clear that ultimately Dan Roger fell in love with her. And she fell in love with him. And she loved him for who he was, and not just the stats that he could provide. It shouldn't have happened. It was wrong. He was a married man with four kids. And it shouldn't have happened. But it did. And Dan Ryder struggled for two years with what he should do about it. His unhappiness in the marriage, by the way, was not a secret between them. The separation wasn't something that just came out of the blue. By the summer of 1983, two years before they actually separated, he had tried to tell Elizabeth Broderick that he was unhappy, that it wasn't working, that he wanted out. This is when she has claimed he said all sorts of mean, cruel things about her being old and fat and boring. At other times, she has said that he was never cruel. Nevertheless, it was very shortly after that when Elizabeth Broderick did something that certainly had a significant impact on Dan and on the marriage. She slit her wrists. This happened in November of 1983, shortly after Dan told her that he wanted out of the marriage. And right about the time that she claimed she started to suspect that he was involved with Linda Colquina. She hadn't uncovered anything that confirmed that, but he had hired her in September, and she suspected, and her response was to slit her wrists with a razor. She had four children at the time. The youngest was four years old. Elizabeth Broderick herself has described that when Dan found her that night, that he cried, that he told her nothing was going on, and that he promised to stay with her. And he did, for another two very tumultuous years. 
by the way, the cuts on her wrists turned out to be very superficial ones, very superficial ones. She never required any stitches. She never required any medical treatment at all. This was not a true suicide attempt. It was an example of the extremes that she would go to to control situations of people. But things never got any better. Um, even Elizabeth Broderick has admitted that those next two years were miserable. It was during that time, uh, for example, that she decided to burn his clothes, Dan's clothes. She went to Dan's office one day, apparently to surprise him, and he wasn't there, and she immediately assumed that he was doing something inappropriate with Linda, which was not the case. And so she went home, she gathered up all his clothes, armful after armful, dumped them in a big pile in the backyard, and while her children tried to stop her and cried, she poured gasoline all over them and lit them into a bonfire in the backyard. She was in a rage, she was furious, and she acted on her anger. When the marriage ended in February of 1985, it followed shortly on the heels of an argument that Christmas where Elizabeth Broderick was again furious, but this time it was because Dan had not bought her the present that she wanted. And this is her own description of that. I also had a ring on my wish list, a beautiful diamond eye popper from the collection in La Jolla. We certainly had the money for it. It looked great on my long fingers, and God knows after all he put me through, I earned it. In fact, I told him he owed me big this Christmas. He presented me with a teeny weeny ring like you'd give a 10 year old. It wouldn't even fit my pinky and I wouldn't be caught dead wearing it anyway. I didn't need a ring. I only wanted the ring. If he didn't want to splurge for the ring, he needn't have insulted me with that tiny piece of shit. I told him it wasn't even worth the gas in my car to return it and gave it to my daughter. Like I said, it was ultimately Dan Breider's decision to leave the marriage, even though Elizabeth Breider had left before. There was one occasion where she just disappeared for a couple of days. But it wasn't because he suddenly turned 40. And it wasn't because he suddenly had a midlife crisis. And it wasn't because he didn't like the fact, fact that Elizabeth Broderick had gotten old and fat. She was neither old nor fat when they separated. She was only 37 years old, and she was, in fact, thin and beautiful. In fact, this is a photograph of her in 1985, the year that they separated. It didn't have anything to do with rejecting her for her looks. It had to do with being in a loveless and volatile and unhappy marriage for years, recognizing that it wasn't going to get any better, and finally deciding that he just couldn't live that way anymore. If Elizabeth Broderick was angry about things and felt that he owed her, before the marriage ended, Dan Broderick was totally unprepared for what was to come after. One of the other ways that you'll hear about that Elizabeth Broderick chose to exact some revenge, and perhaps the most significant one, was her refusal to take care of their children after their separation. After their separation, you will hear that Dan Broderick obtained custody of their poor children, and he did. But it wasn't because he snatched them away in some fancy legal move, which is how she always described it. It was because she gave them to him intentionally. One by one, over the course of a couple of months right after the separation, 
she just dropped them off with him in tears, not understanding what was going on. And the comment that she made to several of her friends was, if I'm not going to be Mrs. Daniel T. Broderick, he can take care of the kids. See what woman wants him with four kids. She knew that he was totally ill-equipped to be a full-time parent. He was a full-time workaholic attorney. And dumping the kids in his lap was a way of punishing him. It was, she wasn't about to let him leave her and go have a carefree single lifestyle. It was, you want to leave? Fine, here's what you get. Dan Broderick didn't refuse to take the children like he could have. He didn't pick them up and jump them off and them. They were traumatized enough. He couldn't understand why she was doing it. But he basically set about trying to take care of all four kids the best he could. And it was tough. It was tough on all of them. He wasn't real good at it. He'd never been their primary caretaker. He'd been the primary wager. But he did try. He certainly didn't abandon them. When Elizabeth Broderick found out, realized that forcing him to take care of the kids didn't really make him as miserable as she thought, when they actually all started doing reasonably well, she just got angrier. Her attitude then was, how dare he actually keep them? But she wouldn't take the kids back, even though at that point he would have willingly let her. They were a tremendous handful for him. She has lots of excuses for that now. She started acting out in other destructive ways. On one occasion, she went out and bought a can of black spray paint and spray painted all over the inside and outside of the house. On another occasion, she took a pie and smeared it all over his clothes and the bedspread and the carpet. She'd throw rocks at his car, rip off his antenna, dump trash in the front yard. This sort of thing was going on for months and months after the separation, right after the separation. It was such a traumatic time for these kids. These things were making it very difficult. Dan Broderick pleaded with her to stop, but her response was basically that it was her house too, and it was, and so she could do anything she wanted. Finally, after several months, he didn't know what else to do, and so he went to court and he got a restraining order to try and prevent her from coming over and vandalizing the house. Unfortunately, getting served with the restraining order just made her matter. No court was going to tell her what to do. And besides, she felt that if she was hurt, and she was angry, and she was acting out like this, it wasn't her fault. She didn't want the divorce. He did. It was his fault for leaving her in the divorce. In December of 1985, it was 10 months after the separation, they separated in February. By December, Dan Broderick decided to move out of La Jolla to the house in Marston Hills that you saw where he uh, was ultimately killed. Maybe moving into another part of town, into a different house, might help diffuse things, make this stuff stop. But the problem was that he still did want the divorce. And she still did not. And so it didn't stop. A large part of hurting him then became actively trying to get her children to hate their father as much as she had been. In fact, her goal was, and still is, to get everyone to join in her hate. Some of the evidence that you'll hear that shows the intensity of her hate, uh, her desire to publicly drag Dan Broderick through the muck, and her attempts to sabotage her children's relationship with their father, comes from the messages that she would leave on the phone answering machine at the Marsden Hills house. Sometime in 1986, Dan had installed an answering machine on his phone right about the time when those things started becoming popular. During that time, Elizabeth Broderick had been saying things to him, and particularly to the children, 
that when he would describe them to other people, they had a hard time believing. Sexually describing him and Linda in sexually explicit terms was one example. Telling her children that she was going to kill their father was another. Dan Roderick finally started keeping some of these answering machine messages, some of the ones that were particularly bad, so that, for example, the children's psychologist who was trying to help them through this time could hear what she was actually saying. And we're going to play a sample of some of those messages. Stick like the reporter didn't have to take this down. Yes, sir. <laughs> what, Your Honor? Stick like the reporter didn't have to take it. Take. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this time we'll take our morning recess. We'll be in recess until, until five after, give you enough time. 
Yes. We recess till five minutes after 11. Please remember the admonition not to discuss the case among yourselves nor let anyone else discuss it with you, nor form any opinions till the matter is finally submitted to you. We're in recess. Those messages that you just heard prior to the break uh, were just a very small example of the messages that she left over a period of years and years. The last one that you heard was a message to her youngest son, Rhett, who was seven years old at the time, when she was telling him that he had the choice of spending the day with her or with, and you heard how she described his father. <clears throat> she didn't just speak that way to Dan or to Linda. She spoke that way directly to her children. And she continued to speak that way to her children, despite requests from Dan to stop, despite pleas from her children to stop, despite court orders to stop, despite Dan at one point in frustration refusing to pay her any money if she didn't stop, despite being held in contempt for doing it over and over and over, despite even ultimately being sentenced to some days in jail by a very frustrated judge after flat out ignoring warnings that that was going to happen if she didn't stop. She didn't care. She told her kids, it's a free country. I have a right of free speech. And again, it wasn't her fault. She was always provoked by something that Dan or Linda had done into leaving these messages that her children would hear. Nothing she did was ever her responsibility. Part of the provocation for those messages, she always claimed, was that Linda's voice was on the machine the, that left the message. This is the Broderick's house, no one's home, leave a message at the beat. And she claimed that when she'd call and she'd hear her voice, it would just infuriate her so much that she just couldn't help but leave some vulgar message. And Linda's voice had been on the machine at, uh, at one point in the very beginning. The girls left long and kind of silly messages that their dad didn't think was real appropriate. But when it was realized that that was a problem, her voice was taken off and it didn't make any difference. Elizabeth Broderick continued to leave those messages no matter whose voice was on that machine. She continued to talk to her children off the phone that way all the time. She didn't need to hear Linda's voice in order to provoke her into saying those things. She would also later claim that Dan kept those messages uh, just so that he could build a case against her for custody of the children. But the evidence will show that at the time that she was leaving most of them, in fact, when she left all of those, he didn't need to build a case for custody. She was refusing to take the kids. It wasn't an issue. <laughs> It was also during this time that the defendant started doing some things, even at her own apparent detriment or, or disadvantage, but she'd do them as long as it also was gonna hurt Dan Broderick. And one example of that was forcing her own arrest in order to embarrass him. This happened way back in 1986. It was obviously several years before these killings, but it's an example of how she manipulated situations. Uh, this was the, the night of the Blackstone Ball, and I'm sure that most of you have never even heard of the Blackstone Ball, but it's a big function that the Bar Association puts on once a year. It's kind of like the big event of the year. It was at the Blackstone Ball that the defendant had worn that $10,000 designer dress that I mentioned before. On this particular occasion, she found out that Dan was going and that he was taking Linda. <clears throat> this was November of 1986, so it had been almost two years since they'd been separated and living apart. It'd been over five months since they were formally divorced, but she didn't like the idea that he was going and that he was going with Linda. And so she went over to his house that day to essentially force a confrontation. You will see that she knows how to confront when she wants to. Her own description of that day is that she drove over there, 
She confronted him. She told him that he was a, and this is a quote from her, a gross creature for appearing in public with the office cunt, and that's how she always described Linda, before he settled his obligations to her. She was obviously angry, making a scene. He obviously didn't want her there. This was after she had literally physically attacked him on some prior occasions. And so he asked her to leave. He was in the process of getting ready for the evening. There was a restraining order. She wasn't supposed to be there. But she refused. Uh, he told her that if she didn't leave, he was going to have to call the police. She basically said, go ahead, call the police. I'm not leaving. He didn't try and beat her up. He didn't try and physically throw her off the property himself. He simply called the police to enforce the restraining order. When the police officer got there, she explained to the defendant, it was a woman officer, that there was a valid restraining order in effect, and you have to leave. That's the only thing that Dan Broderick wants. He refused. The officer told her, look, if you don't leave, I'm going to have to arrest you. I'm going to have to physically place you in custody. He gave her several opportunities to just leave so that she didn't have to be arrested. And she refused. And so she was arrested. When she got to jail that day, the first thing that she did was to call up a friend of hers, a woman named Gail Forbes, to tell Gail Forbes that Dan had had her arrested and that she should call the newspapers and tell the newspapers that while the president of the Bar Association was at the Blackstone Ball, he'd had his wife thrown in jail. Gail Forbes describes her as sounding very pleased with herself. Gail Forbes didn't call the press. Uh, the defendant bailed out that night. Dan Broderick's evening was pretty much ruined. And thereafter, on many occasions, many occasions, she talked about how he had brutalized her by throwing her in jail. Before I go any further, one thing that all of you need to know is that Elizabeth Broderick now claims that during the marriage, during her marriage with Dan Broderick, that he was physically abusive to her. This is something that you'll see that she never said anything about until after she was accused of his murder. You may have to decide the credibility of that claim and the relevance. You may have to consider the motives that she might have for saying something like that after she's been charged with murder and after she's killed the only person who could rebut it. The evidence will show that, as I mentioned earlier, she freely talked loud and clear to everyone and anyone about what a jerk she thought Dan Broderick was. She never mentioned that he was physically abusive. Even though she wrote a book about all of the personal, truly personal details of their lives, she never mentions in there that he physically abused her. Even though she was represented by several attorneys during their divorce, where something like that would obviously be important, she never mentioned that he physically abused her. In fact, she said the exact opposite to the extent of how wonderful their marriage had been until Linda came along. And she used to laugh about how he was afraid of her, that she was bigger and stronger than he was. You will also hear that no one ever saw Dan Broderick physically abuse her, including their four children. He did have a temper. He wasn't perfect any more than any of the rest of us are, and he could yell if he was angry, as could she. And when he got frustrated, he could take a hammer to a lawnmower. But that was it. He didn't direct his anger physically at other people. And there will be absolutely no evidence that for the entire four, almost five year period after they separated, that he ever did anything to her physically other than try and avoid her or try and protect himself. During those years, it was Elizabeth Broderick who set out on a course to destroy Dan and Linda Broderick, not the other way around. She said she was going to do it, and she did it. During these years, the actual divorce proceedings were moving through the court system. 
but not very quickly. Elizabeth Broderick has always claimed that Dan Broderick intentionally dragged things out just to make it tough on her, that this was emotional abuse going through the court system and that she could never win going up against the powerful Dan Broderick. As a matter of fact, you'll see that she did win several times when they ended up taking something before a judge. No one was rubber stamping Dan Broderick's requests. In fact, they were probably bending over backwards not to. You will see that Elizabeth Broderick is a person who sees things as either black or white. You're either for her or you're against her. And if you're against her in any way, then you're the enemy. Like a, a friend who might try to describe something from Dan's perspective. She was no longer a friend. Or like a daughter who might say something nice about her father or worse, Linda. If that happened, her mother would have a fit. She'd yell at her, she'd hit her, she'd call her a traitor, tell her she hated her. None of these children were ever allowed to express anything positive about their father, and heaven forbid, about Linda. And by the time they got involved in the actual litigation, it didn't matter what Dan Broderick did. It was going to be viewed and portrayed by her as being intentionally rotten. He was unquestionably the bad guy. He was damned if he did and damned if he didn't on just about everything. And it wasn't long before the claim became that the entire San Diego legal system, including her own attorneys, were, for reasons never really explained, joined in this conspiracy against her. The evidence will show, one, that there was never any conspiracy against her, and two, that Dan Broderick had no motive to drag out a long divorce with an obviously bitter ex-wife. He was the one who wanted out. He was the one who had a life he wanted to live. It was Elizabeth Broderick who wouldn't let go. And everyone who knew her, everyone recognized that. He also, by the way, wasn't a divorce lawyer. Uh, he didn't have anything to do with divorce law. That's taken care of in an entirely different building. And he had to hire a lawyer just like everyone else does to represent him. And he had to pay the lawyer for every continued hearing and motion, just like everyone else. The primary issue between them was money. And that was from her perspective, not the kids, but money. That was more important. Her attitude was that he owed her. She said that many times. And by that time, by 1987, by 1988, he was making a tremendous amount of money. He was still going to work every day and working very hard for his money, but he was very successful. And she felt that since she had lived through the lean years and he was the one that wanted a divorce, that he owed her, perhaps more than the law allows. In fact, she has even admitted that she exaggerated her expenses prior to the separation so that she could get more money out of them. Dan Broderick was obviously in the best position to recognize that. But from very early on, even though the superficial fight appeared to be about money, Dan Broderick and others recognized that the true underlying issue was that no matter how much money he gave her, or no matter how much money he was ordered to pay her, it wasn't gonna be enough because that wasn't what she really wanted. What she wanted was to be Mrs. Daniel T. Broderick. And that was something that he just couldn't give her anymore. One of the first examples of that recognition that her fight wasn't really over money came very early on in the course of the divorce, and it basically set the stage for everything that was to follow. And that was when Dan Broderick wanted to sell their home on Coral Reef. And I have to back up a, a minute here to explain this to you, and I apologize ahead of time for the length of the explanation, but it's important to put these things in perspective. <clears throat> for 
for several years before Dan and Elizabeth Broderick had separated. They had lived in a house in La Jolla on a street called Coral Reef. They all lived there. Um, it was a very nice home on a large lot. But for the last couple years of their marriage, they had both basically wanted to move someplace bigger. In the meantime, the slab on the Coral Reef house had cracked and it needed to be fixed. And it was a major thing. They had to move out in order to do that. And so they did. They all moved out into a rental house, uh, which was in a La Jolla Shores area of La Jolla, which is one of the nicest areas of La Jolla. It's just a couple of blocks from the beach. When they separated, which was in February of 85, Dan moved back into the Coral Reef House. It was still under construction. There wasn't any furniture in there. It was basically a mess, but for lack of any place better to go, he moved into Coral Reef and was basically sleeping on the floor on a sleeping bed. That house was where Elizabeth Broderick, one by one, brought the kids and left them with him in the empty Coral Reef House. The lease on the rental was due to be up in June of 85. And so Dan had offered to move out of Coral Reef. The defendant could move in. He'd go find a condo somewhere. But she didn't want to do that. She had found a house that she wanted to buy in the La Jolla Shores area. And so Dan agreed to do that. They bought a house on a street called Calle de Cielo for the defendant to move in. And she did. She moved in. And this is the house that she continued to live in until the time of these murders. It uh, also was a beautiful home. When she first moved in, it needed a lot of fixing up, but it was on a gorgeous lot overlooking the ocean with a view of the ocean. It had four bedrooms, six and a half baths. It had a pool, had a jacuzzi, had a putting green. It uh, cost $650,000 and later sold for over a million dollars. In fact, this is the real estate ad for that house on Calle de Cielo that the defendant lived in. Right after she moved into Calle de Cielo was the period of time that I talked about where she was going over to Coral Reef and vandalizing the house. By December, Dan had then decided to move to the house in Marsden Hills. It also was a, was a very nice house, cost about $600,000. It too needed some fixing up. It was an older home. He and the children moved in there. So at that time, Dan was paying the mortgages for both the house in Marsden Hills and the house in Calle de Cielo, which were both fairly substantial. They were expensive homes. And he was also paying the mortgage on the Coral Reef house, which was now sitting empty. Nobody was there anymore. And so he wanted to sell it. It's what's called a wasting asset. Uh, he wanted to sell it and split the proceeds between the two of them 50 50. It's a community asset. At that point, Elizabeth Broderick was being represented by an attorney named Dan Jaffe from Beverly Hills. He's a very well known divorce attorney in Beverly Hills. He'd been recommended to her. Dan Broderick's attorney began negotiating with her attorney, Dan Jaffe, for the sale of the Coral Reef House and splitting the proceeds 50 50. Mr. Jaffe actually came down to San Diego to have a meeting in person. They set up a meeting with Dan Broderick, his attorney, Elizabeth Broderick, her attorney. When they got to the office that day, Elizabeth Broderick and her attorney, she decided she didn't want to come up and be part of the meeting. She wanted to stay down in the car. So Mr. Jaffe went upstairs to have the meeting with Dan Broderick and his attorney. Mr. Jaffe explained her basic position, and that was that she felt she was entitled to more than 50% of the split. She felt that when Dan had decorated the Coral Reef house after the slab had been fixed, that he had actually diminished the value of the house, and so she was entitled to a credit for that. Dan Broderick agreed. He, he didn't agree that his choice of wallpaper had actually diminished the value of the house, but he agreed to give her the extra amount that she wanted over the 50%. They put together an agreement, a written agreement. Mr. Jaffe, her attorney, was pleased. He took it downstairs to have her sign it, and she refused. She wanted more than that, what they had agreed to. 
So Mr. Jaffe went back upstairs, told Dan Broderick she wants more than what we've agreed to, and again, Dan Broderick agreed. Mr. Jaffe, who was essentially Dan Broderick's adversary at that point, describes Dan as being entirely reasonable, that he had told her him, look, it, it's not worth the fight, just give her what she wants. And Dan Broderick said, okay. They put together another agreement. They went, she went back downstairs to her in the car, and again, she refused to sign it. He explained to her that, look, this is a good deal. Uh, he, he's entitled by law to sell it. If he goes to court, a court's going to allow him to sell it, and he's only going to give you 50%. That's really what you're entitled to. This is a good deal. She took him to the airport, sent him back up to Beverly Hills, and she refused to sign the agreement. When it was clear that she wasn't going to cooperate in the sale of the house, Dan Broderick's attorney did have to go to court and get an order to sell the house. This happened in February of 1986. It had been a year since they'd separated, and it was clear that trying to give her what she claimed she wanted, trying to work things out amicably with her or with her attorney, didn't work. It didn't work at all. Her her ultimate comment about Coral Reef was, I wouldn't agree to sell it if he sold it for a million dollars. It wasn't the money. It was the fight. The next day, when Elizabeth Broderick found out that he'd gotten an order to sell the house, she was furious. <laughs> she couldn't have been tremendously surprised because Mr. Jaffe had told her that that was what was going to happen if she didn't sign. But she was mad that it did. And she charged over to Dan Broderick's house, determined to have a confrontation, demanding to talk to him. He refused. He was pretty frustrated at that point, and he knew real well by that time that yelling and screaming at each other wasn't going to do any good. He basically told her, our attorneys are going to have to deal with it. I want you to leave. Well, she left, but she wasn't done. The first thing she did was to drive over to the Coral Reef house all the way from Marsden Hills to La Jolla to the Coral Reef House. She smashed a sliding glass door with a brick to get into the house. She got a can of gasoline. She poured the gasoline on the carpet, and she tried to light it on fire. Fortunately, it wouldn't ignite. It was good carpet. <clears throat> but she was still furious. She hadn't bent it enough. And so she drove all the way back over to Dan's house from La Jolla back to Marsden Hills. And in her own words, she purposefully smashed her suburban truck right into the front door of his house, drove up over the driveway, up over the steps, smashed it into the front door of the house, backed up and smashed again, literally knocking the, the door off its hinges, terrifying everyone, including the children that were inside the house. This is a <coughs> photograph of the damage to the door that she did when she smashed into it with her suburban van. <clears throat> Doing this, smashing her car into the front door, trying to light coral reef on fire, was not only, again, pretty extreme, it was dangerous. One of her children could have been coming out that front door right when she decided to go smashing into it. The neighbors had called the police, and she was arrested. She has always claimed that Dan, that day Dan had her committed to a mental institute, uh, but that's not what happened. Although he, he was concerned about her emotional state, he did express that concern to the police officer. The police officer decided to take her to county mental health, and the admitting physician there decided to admit her for a, what's called a 72-hour hold, a three-day hold. Actually, after two days, she was allowed to leave, but she refused to sign the release papers, and so she stayed for another day. Even though she had been arrested for vandalism, Dan Broderick did not press charges. And even after this happened, he still did give her what she wanted as far as splitting the proceeds of Coral Reef. The very next month after the house sold, she received $127,000 in cash, and he took $47,000 as the split at that time. 
It was shortly after this incident, and partly in response to it, that the court ordered on the recommendation of the psychologist who was dealing with the Broderick kids and concerned about them, that Elizabeth Broderick have no visitation with the children until she underwent some psychological counseling. It was that court order that she often later told people about describing it as though Dan had simply waltzed into court and with the snap of his fingers gotten an order for full custody and, and no visitation to her. The judge did issue that order, but her story never included what her actions were that led up to that. And it never included the fact that she had received notice of that hearing and had the opportunity to be there and she simply refused to go. And it never included the fact that after that order was made, which was by its terms temporary, that she continued to refuse to take the children, even when people were actively trying to get her to for their sake. By this time, these children were unquestionably suffering. But her hate and her greed and her need to get even were still more important. In 1987, a whole year later, while the defendant was now being represented by her fourth attorney, she had hired and fired the previous three. She ended up firing this fourth one as well. They tried to mediate the case so that it didn't have to go to court. There had already been two court-ordered conciliation meetings that they were ordered to go to. Dan had appeared at both. Elizabeth Broderick had refused to show up at either. But in March of 1987, her attorney and his attorney agreed to have them meet with a professional mediator, a woman named Dr. Ruth Roth, who was known for her skills at mediating these kinds of things. She has worked with literally thousands of couples going through divorces. Dr. Roth met with Dan Broderick and she met with Elizabeth Broderick on several occasions. She specifically wanted to work it out so that if the defendant wanted, she would have custody of her kids and Dan would have visitation. Unfortunately, Dr. Roth realized at the very first meeting that Elizabeth Broderick had no intention of taking custody and no one was going to talk her into it. Dr. Roth describes her meetings with Elizabeth Broderick as one of a kind. She didn't even want to talk about the children. All she wanted to do was talk about how much she hated Dan and Linda. One of her specific statements was, that little fucker was mine and he'll stay mine. This was March of 1987. It had been over two years since they'd been separated and they were long divorced. When Dr. Roth tried to talk to her about the children, get her focused back on that issue, Elizabeth Broderick would say there was no way she was going to be the single mother of four children. Dan Broderick would die first. I mentioned the thousands of cases that Dr. Roth had dealt with in her career. She, she'd obviously heard a lot of anger and a lot of venting. That's not particularly unusual. But only on a very few occasions had she ever felt the need to take someone's statements seriously enough to warn the other person about them. And this was one of them. She called up Dan Broderick to warn him about the threats that Elizabeth Broderick was making and the need to perhaps take them seriously. And incidentally, he did take them seriously. Uh, by this time, he had been telling his children for quite some time that he was going to, that she, she had been telling her children for quite some time that she was going to kill their father. There were five, maybe six different times over the years where he went so far as to hire security guards to come to his house to protect him because he was afraid of what she was getting ready to do. After three sessions with, the, with Dr. Roth, Elizabeth Broderick refused to come back. And she told Dr. Roth the reason. She said, you're too good. You make me forget how much I hate Dan and Linda. So I'm not coming back. 
She didn't want to put the hate behind it. She wanted to keep it alive. She had the ability, she had the means, she had the professional help to do it, but she chose not to. And so there was no mediated agreement. There was no settlement. And she continued to tell her friends and family that Dan was doing a horrible job of raising the kids, and the only reason he had them was because he had used his legal influence to steal them away. She continued to tell her children that it was entirely their father's fault that they couldn't live with her. Even though Dan Broderick had an order for full custody with no visitation, and even though the children's psychologist at that point was recommending that she actually have no contact with them, he could never stick to that. Uh, the boys in particular wanted very much to spend time with their mother, and they'd beg him to, to let them go, and so he'd let them. Every time, hoping that things would get better, hoping that her anger would run its course, that she'd stop poisoning them against him. But it never did. She never stopped telling them that their dad didn't love them and that he and Linda were the sole cause of all of their unhappiness and all of her unhappiness. She kept this photograph right out on a bookshelf in her house. It's a photograph of Dan. And it says, the most hated man in America caught with his pants down. She had this out on a bookshelf in her house for her kids to see whenever they came over, for their friends could see whenever they came over. This was another photograph that she kept out of the family. She sent a whole group of pictures to her little son, Rhett, who was eight years old at the time of the family and of Dan, where she'd made a point of crossing out all the pictures of Dan and writing things on the back, such as wimpy faggot, excuse of a man. She sent these to her eight-year-old son. Kim, their, their oldest daughter, tried to explain to a judge at one point about how her mother was brainwashing these kids against their father. She also never stopped telling them things like they didn't have to mind Linda or that it was okay for them to also call her a cunt. She thought that was funny. Or to take scissors and cut up her clothes or to gag on her food and spit it out or to pour boiling hot water on her. Linda wanted very much to have a relationship with these kids, but she never had a chance and all of the defendant's accusations against her were pretty overwhelming. Both Dan and Linda ended up getting unquestionably frustrated and afraid, not necessarily making all the right decisions or doing all the right things, but they were firsthand witnesses of how the extreme hate that Elizabeth Broderick had for them was so emotionally devastating these kids. On one occasion, for example, the defendant called up her son, Brett. Again, he was eight years old. A babysitter happened to overhear the conversation. It was on the phone. She was calling from her house. Rhett was at his house. And the first words out of her mouth to Rhett were, is the cunt there? And when Rhett said, I don't know, Mom, she said, well, you've got to get the cunt out of the house or I'm not going to talk to you. And when Rhett cried and got upset and said, Mom, I can't do that, she continued with, well, if you don't get her out of the house, you can't come visit me either. After that conversation, Rhett was so upset that he locked himself in the bathroom. He took a pair of scissors. He took his hair and he started cutting chunks of hair off of his head. The babysitter found him locked in the bathroom like that. Elizabeth Broderick has made much of the fact that Dan would even sometimes unplug the phone so that she couldn't talk to the children. And that's true. He did occasionally do that. This was one of those occasions. 
when he came home and he found out what she had said to his little boy, and when he saw the anguish that his little boy was going through, he did unplug the phone so she couldn't talk to him for a while. He didn't know what else to do. Not only did she constantly express her hate to these kids, she also never stopped demanding every detail of Dan and Linda's lives. She would say that she could care less about them. She didn't care about them at all. And she would say it very convincingly. But every time she saw her kids or anyone else who had any information, she would want to know everything there was to know about what they were doing, where they were going, who they were going with, what they were wearing, what they were eating. She was obsessed with their lives and with not letting them live it. As I mentioned during these years of 86, 87, 88, 89, Elizabeth Broderick continued to live in her house on Calle de Cielo in La Jolla. One of her most common complaints that she made very vocally was that when Dan left her, that he had left her homeless and penniless. Those were her words. Even though the house that she moved into needed some fixing up when she first moved in, she obviously was not left homeless. And she was able over those years to put $200,000 into that house, uh, including putting in a separate pool house, completely remodeling the kitchen, decorating the entire house. She certainly wasn't left penniless. Even though it wasn't as much as she felt she deserved, the court had ordered that Dan pay her $16,100 a month in support which is almost $200,000 a year. She owned a suburban van. She had an XKE Jaguar. She was able to continue and did continue to buy fur coats and diamond jewelry, $10,000 watches. She took trips to shopping trips to New York every year. She went to Tahiti. She went to Hawaii. She went skiing at Deer Valley, which is an exclusive ski resort in Utah. Her friends describe her as certainly appearing to have enough money to spend on anything she wanted, and she spent a lot. She had started dating Brad Wright, the man that I mentioned at the very beginning, back in 1985, the year of their separation. And she continued to have a full relationship with him. They slept together, they showered together, all the way up until the time of this incident. In fact, she's written love letters to him from jail, where she has described the incredibly wonderful times they spent together. Those are her words. She took several trips with him to San Francisco, to New Orleans, to Acapulco. She and Brad Wright had been in Acapulco the weekend before these murders. But you'll see that she would never admit the true nature of her relationship with Brad Wright to other people. In fact, she actually talked about him in very demeaning ways, although he didn't know it. Uh, she has said, for example, that having him around was like having a dog, only he was house trained. She wouldn't tell a lot of her friends uh, either how much money she was actually getting because the truth didn't generate as much sympathy as she wanted. During this time, she was also active in a small investment club. Uh, in fact, she was the president of it for several years, a group of women who got together to discuss investments. She was known as being very bright and very knowledgeable in the stock market. Uh, in fact, some people have described her as the most intelligent woman they've ever met. She had a real estate license that she'd received in 1984. She also had an interior decorator's license. She had a college degree. She'd been a teacher. She had the ability to be very charming when she wanted. She was always the center of attention in any group. She had the ability to be wonderful with children if she wanted. She had the ability, in fact, to do anything she set her mind to. But the evidence will show that despite all of these tremendous advantages, many of which 
most people don't even come close to having. None of it was enough. And it wasn't enough for the very simple reason that in her view, Dan Broderick had more. As each year passed, in her view, he continued to have more. He continued to have his friends. He continued to be well thought of. He continued to be financially successful. And Linda was the one who was sharing it with him. And that burned in her like nothing else. She was tremendously upset and angry and depressed about it. Hate generally doesn't breed a whole lot of happiness. It's a pretty ugly emotion. She started to gain weight. That made her more depressed. And all of this was Dan and Linda's fault. And that just generated more hate. Hate upon hate upon hate. And so she decided that rather than build something out of her life, she was going to destroy someone else's. But in January of 1989, 11 months before the murders, something fairly significant happened. The divorce proceedings finally came to an end. The defendant had claimed that one of the major sources of her upset was the uncertainty of not having things settled. And that's understandable. Uh, there had been a lot of motions and things going back and forth between both sides. But in January of 1989, things got settled. They had a trial uh, in front of a judge. He made all the decisions. He was a judge who didn't know either side. Many people who were close to, to the defendant thought or hoped that finally having it settled would be a real step towards putting it behind and moving on with their life. But things are only over if you want them to be over. Sometimes the problem is if the fight's over, then everything is over. She refused to let the fight be over. She was furious at the divorce result. She had it set in her mind exactly what she thought she was going to get, and she didn't get it. Dan Broderick didn't get exactly what he thought he was going to get either. That's how those things sometimes go. But Elizabeth Broderick claimed that she had been cheated and she would accept no alternate possibility for her life, no matter who tried to present it to her. By the time of the trial in 1989, she had decided at that point to argue for custody of the kids. But after listening to the testimony of two different psychiatrists, the judge had decided that it, he felt it was still in the boy's best interest to leave them in the custody of Dan. But he did give the defendant set standard visitation every other weekend, alternating holidays, a whole month in July, alternating ski weeks. And he also awarded custody of Lee, one of her daughters, to the defendant. Kim at that point was in college and she wasn't uh, at issue. Lee was 16 at that time and a fairly troubled young girl at that particular time going back and forth between both parents, not getting along with either one of them very well. She'd gotten involved in drugs. Uh, she'd been kicked out of school. Her father felt very strongly about drugs and about going to school and they definitely were not getting along. On that very day, the day that the defendant was awarded custody of Lee, she was so angry at the piddly amount of child support that she got, that was her word, which was $1,500 a month in addition to the $16,000 in alimony, that she kicked Lee out of the house. She told her for that amount of money, it wasn't worth taking care of her. Elizabeth Broderick did two other things after the divorce trial. We're now in February and March of 1989. She hired an attorney to appeal the divorce, which she certainly had every right to do. But it was her decision to keep that litigation going. And she started talking seriously about killing Dan and Linda. 
Her desire to kill them, as I mentioned, was something that she had expressed often before, but no one really took those threats all that seriously, except perhaps Dr. Roth and maybe Linda. But in March of 1989, <clears throat> Elizabeth Broderick bought a gun, the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson that she used to kill Dan and Linda with. This was about a month before Dan and Linda were to be married in April. She knew that they were getting married. In fact, one day when she went into their house, again in violation of a restraining order, she saw their wedding list, the list of people that were to come to the wedding, and she stole it creating a fair amount of upset. Uh, Linda even went over to her house when she knew she wouldn't be there to try and retrieve it, but she couldn't find it. Elizabeth Broderick thought that was funny. What's everybody so upset about? She never did return it. She told people, like a woman named Sylvia Cavins, who was another of Dan's housekeepers, that she was gonna kill Dan Broderick at the wedding. She was gonna shoot him in the head. And when Sylvia said, to her something like, how could you do that? You'd, you'd leave your kids orphans. Her response was, no, I won't, because no jury in the world will convict me when they hear what Dan Broderick did to me. She started practicing her shooting at a shooting range. She bragged about what a good shot she was, and she was a good shot. She is a good shot. She unquestionably knows how to handle a gun. And her threats were now definitely taken seriously. Dan and Linda Broderick had to hire security guards for their wedding. Not an optimum way to have a wedding. A security guard actually followed the defendants every move that day because they were so concerned. She obviously didn't do anything on the day of the wedding, perhaps because of the security. She spent the day with a friend a good friend, a woman named Helen Picard, who wanted to try and make the day easier for her. Actually, tried to get her to go out of town, and she wouldn't. But after the wedding, which didn't occur until over four years after her separation, it had been over four years before Dan Broderick remarried, the hate that she felt for them, and particularly for Linda, reached its peak because now Linda was no longer that young, dumb bimbo that Dan was messing around with, which is how she always described her. Now Linda was Mrs. Daniel T. Broderick. And as far as she was concerned, that was her right, and only her right. Dan and Linda went on their honeymoon. Over the summer and into the fall, leading up to November the 5th, the defendant was fairly involved in quite a few things. And by the way, we talked a little bit about this before. Several questions were asked of you about your feelings about psychologists. This is not an insanity case. You will hear no evidence that the defendant was insane or didn't know right from wrong before, during, or after these killings, because she wasn't. She went on a trip to Canada with her boys in July. She actually spent almost the entire summer with her boys. She hadn't had to go to court for months. The only things happening in court were things that she was generating. Things were not getting cumulatively worse and worse. They were getting better, at least from most people's perspective. But perhaps that was part of the problem. It was also at this point that she started taking her gun out and putting it in her pocket whenever she knew Dan Broderick was coming over to pick up the boys at the end of a of a visitation. And her children knew that she was doing that. They saw her do that. He never gave her a chance or an opportunity or an excuse to use it. He tried very hard to avoid any kind of confrontation. Whenever he would come over, he would just stay out in front of the house and honk for the boys so that there wouldn't be a confrontation. In September of 1989, the murders were in November. The defendant had had her attorney file a motion in court for custody of the boys. Now, not just visitation, but custody. There was basically only this one battle left to fight. 
when Dan Broderick received that motion, he didn't just slough it off because, as she would say, he had complete control over the legal system anyway. He took it very seriously. The situation was becoming increasingly hard on these kids emotionally, seeing their mother with the gun, hearing her threaten to kill him, telling them to run away from their father. And so, despite some real uncertainty about whether it was the right thing to do, uh, and despite some recommendations from friends and professionals, Dan Broderick began negotiating with her attorney to give her what she claimed she wanted, custody of the two boys, Dan. Be light, be you. My style changes from day one. Her attorney had started negotiating to transfer custody of the boys. She had started back up, leaving messages on their answering machine where she made a point a needless point of calling Linda vulgar names again. It wasn't the first time that just when it looked like she was going to get what she claimed she wanted, that she would do something to sabotage it, to make Dan mad, because she knew if she pushed hard enough, ultimately his reaction was going to be to push back. But it wasn't working anymore. He didn't want to fight anymore. He didn't want to add fuel to the fire. He wasn't rising to her bait. In fact, uh, his attorney had tried to get him to essentially play hardball with her several times over the summer by filing contempt actions, and he wouldn't do it. At the very least, he let his attorney write her attorney a letter basically asking him to get his client, Elizabeth Broderick, to stop doing this stuff. Why is she doing this when we're trying to work it out? But when Elizabeth Broderick was telling Linda David, the housekeeper that I mentioned at the very beginning, that she was going back to court to get custody of her boys, Miss David describes that she didn't even appear to care as though whether she was going to get them. Her focus instead was on how she was still determined to make Dan and Linda's lives miserable. The problem was she wasn't being successful in making their lives miserable anymore. There were a series of things that they did together during those last weeks and months that fueled not only her jealousy, but her realization that she was losing in this quest to make them miserable. They took several trips together, uh, which was actually one reason why she didn't have the opportunity to kill them earlier. One in particular, only weeks before the murders, was a trip to South Bend for the USC Notre Dame game. This was an annual thing that had become kind of a tradition in the Broderick family. All the Broderick family were Notre Dame fans. That year, Dan had flown Kim and Danny and Red out. Elizabeth Broderick was openly bitter and angry about that. This was still something that she felt she ought to be involved in as Mrs. Broderick, not Linda. Ms. Wells, you're going to be more than another 10 minutes. No, I'm almost done. <clears throat> All right, go ahead. <clears throat> the evidence will show that what was happening in those days, just before November the 5th, was that Elizabeth Broderick got to the point where a couple of things became very clear. One was that with all of the things she did have, her her income, her home, her boyfriend, her abilities, and now it looked like the children. She wasn't going to be able to continue to claim how horribly victimized she was by Dan and Linda anymore. Those kinds of claims had been falling on deaf ears for quite some time. And two, it was clear that no matter what she did, she wasn't going to be able to make Dan and Linda's lives miserable anymore. They were going on with their lives, no matter what. She had already burned his clothes. She'd vandalized his house. She'd driven her car through the door. She'd publicly embarrassed them both. She'd left vulgar messages on the machine. She'd turned his children against him. There wasn't much left to do. And the simple truth is, and the evidence will show, that Dan and Linda were living happily, and she hated them for it because she was still miserable and there was no way she was going to let them get away with it and so on the morning of november 5th 
she took advantage of the opportunity that was there and she decided to do what she'd been saying she was going to do for years she went over to their house she took her loaded gun and she got even in the only way that was left after she shot them after she pulled the phone out of the wall and left them there for dead she called several people to tell them what she had done as i mentioned one of them was her daughter lee <laughs> she also told her daughter that morning that she'd been planning on killing herself too but that she ran out of bullets the evidence will show that she never even came close to actually making any attempt on her own life in fact there was a whole box of bullets back at her house that she could have gone and gotten if she wanted she didn't in her own words after she killed dan and linda the situation was resolved she even laughed about killing linda in a later conversation from jail with helen picard in a conversation with her daughter kim from jail only a couple of days later she still did not express any remorse for what she'd done the main thing she wanted was to make sure that Kim was going to be on her side. And when Kim, who was obviously grieving over the horrible death and loss of her father and Linda, when she didn't know how to answer that, her mother yelled at her, called her a traitor, told her she hated her, left her in tears. This is a woman who has and continues to profess that all she cares about is her children. In fact, you will see that all she really cares about is herself. This case is about the killing of two people by sneaking into their home and shooting them as they lay helpless in their sleep. Shooting them before they can do anything to protect themselves. Shooting them before they could even plead for their lives. You are undoubtedly going to hear all sorts of things, good, bad, and indifferent, about everybody involved here that may be interesting, maybe not. But don't lose sight of why you're here. You are here because of what Elizabeth Broderick did on November the 5th, 1989. The evidence will show, and the bottom line is, she killed two helpless people because she hated them. And that is murdered. Thank you.